something needs to be done to break this impasse uh, because climate change is about to make America's flood risk a whole lot worse. Uh, despite that threat, despite the threat of flood risk and, and rising sea levels, building in flood prone areas continues unabated. Between 2000 and 2016, the population in 100 year floodplains grew by 14%. <coughs> that was compared to 13% in the rest of the nation combined. So we're actually growing faster in flood prone regions than outside of them. Uh, and this problem is most acute in the coastal zones that are impacted by sea level rise. Looking at development just since 2010, in eight coastal states, there have been home, more homes built in areas that are projected by 2050 to face an annual 10% risk of serious coastal flooding. So that's, that's 10 times worse than the 100-year floodplain. Um, there are more in those zones than outside of them. Uh, in Delaware, Mississippi, New Jersey, and Rhode Island, development in the 10-year floodplain has actually been twice as fast as outside, the, outside that floodplain. In Connecticut, it's been three times as fast. So that, those numbers, by the way, come from a, a 2019 report from uh, Climate Central and Zillow, uh, which estimated by the end of the century, by 2100, 6,500 homes that have been built just since 2010 uh, should expect to face flooding every 10 years rather than every 100. This is why I proposed in a new policy study, which is available outside this room, that Congress make a change in how the NFIP operates. Rather than extend coverage to any property in a participating community, the program should cease writing, cease writing coverage uh, for new construction in 100-year floodplains. The analysis that we did of 30 years of FEMA claims data suggests that if such a policy were in place, for properties built in 1980 or later, then of the 126 billion inflation adjusted that uh, NFIP pay, paid in claims from 1990 through 2019, it would actually be 13% lower. That obviously does not get rid of flood risk. There's still significant flood risk outside that zone and for older properties, but it would make a significant difference. The idea that, that we're putting forward is based on the coastal barrier resources uh, system which has been a, a, a pretty significant success. That was created in 1982. Uh, it, it is a system of 3.5 million acres of beaches, wetlands, barrier islands, and estuaries along the Atlantic Ocean, the Gulf of Mexico, and the Great Lakes that are deemed completely ineligible for federal subsidies for development. The law does not prohibit development within that zone, but it does require that any development that occurs must be financed entirely with private funds. As a result, more than 80% of the potentially develop, developable units within the coastal barrier resources system are still undeveloped. Uh, a 2019 study in the Journal of Coastal Research found that by discouraging development that otherwise would have drawn on federal disaster assistance, housing, transportation, and other subsidies, the CBRS was responsible for 9.5 billion in avoided spending, federal spending from 1989 to 2013 and it projects to save as much as 108 billion over the next 50 years. Another problem we see in NFIP is that the maps FEMA uses to assign rates uh, based on flood risk are badly out of date. The agency is required to review all of its maps every five years. As of year in 2016, only 42% of the program's maps were up to date. Out of the 166 counties that produced annual average flood claims in excess of $2 million, Fully half of them, that is 55% of the NFIP's total risk, use maps that are more than five years old. CBO also identified 42 of these high-risk counties, 26% so of the risk, uh, where the maps are more than 10 years old, and 17 high-risk counties, representing 14% of the <coughs> risk, where they were more than 15 years old. Out outdated maps could be one explanation for another trend we saw in the FEMA data is that a growing portion of claims for new construction, uh, properties that are less than 10 years old, uh, are being filed in the ostensibly lower risk zones, the B, C, D, and X zones. Uh, while these zones accounted for 31% of claims for new construction in the 1990s, by the 2010s it was 40%. Sea level rise also only heightens the urgency to update the maps regularly. A 2019 Princeton University study found that by the end of the 21st century, Today's 100-year floods should be expected every one to 30 years in the southeast and Gulf, and the Gulf Coast, and every single year in New England and the Mid-Atlantic. 
To keep up with those shifts and risks, grandfathering needs to end for all new construction, whether it's in a 100-year fund plan or not. Congress needs to make clear to developers that going forward, any new property they build will be required immediately to pay higher rates anytime a map change shows it is at higher risk. We have been in talks with some members. We believe there may be legislation to do this in, in, in the coming weeks. For these recommendations to be effective, there are other changes that will be needed. Uh, for example, neither of the proposals will have much force unless Congress appropriates the funds uh, that would allow FEMA to meet its target goals for mapping updates. Uh, it's also essential that lending regulators aggressively police the requirements that federally related mortgages are insured, whether it be by the NFIP or private insurance. Without insurance protection, the likelihood of default on mortgages rise, uh, and some of that risk is absorbed by federal agencies like the FHA or the government-sponsored entities like Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Uh, making these changes will not completely resolve the NFIP's fiscal issues, and they only begin to tackle the issue of climate change, uh, but they would serve to discourage building in flood-prone regions, they would remove incentives to build in flood-prone regions, and they would do so, we think importantly, without laying any new burden on any existing policy hold. That's been at the crux of the debate thus far, is raising rates uh, hurts those who have a reliance interest in flood-prone regions. That's not what we're looking to do in this proposal. We do support bringing rates up to actuarial levels, but while we're at this impasse, we think that this is a do-no-harm approach that just removes incentives to making the problem worse. Uh, we hope this could be a compromise that would get Congress's attention. Greg. Okay. Uh, may I disembark yeah. sure, and uh, sure. use these swell? Uh, so, since you weren't going to be bored with a PowerPoint, <laughs> I thought we'd bore you with, uh, <laughs> with these things. Uh, just going to tell a quick story. My name is Craig <coughs> Poulton, Poulton Associates. I've already been introduced. Uh, we sponsored this uh, report created by Hazard Hub, which is a well respected. Uh, data analytics firm, geospatial analytics firm. And uh, it, it should put to rest forever, at least for, for the last 10 years go, uh, as of today, the idea that the NFIP is not subsidizing wealthy people over lower income people. That is a demonstrable fact that this report demonstrates. And it, it uh, hopefully will allow members of Congress to see more clearly a path forward to fairer rates, which the NFIP has already proposed and would like to implement, but uh, is, is being uh, essentially stopped by Congress. Let me just tell you, uh, this is not a true story, uh, thankfully, but it illustrates what we're dealing with. In Utah, we have a lot of fault lines. We, have, we are earthquake prone, as is California. In Utah, we have some places where people build homes at the top of beautiful uh, hillsides so they can have a beautiful vista, as, as happens a lot in California as well. In Utah, they want to see the mountains. In California, it's the sunset. Um, you've all seen pictures of homes sliding off the edge of a cliff, you know, being as, as it goes, and you've got this beautiful home, and it, it, it literally no, no longer exists. Well, there's a, a group of uh, folks in Utah who want to subsidize building homes on the side of mountains, uh, and <coughs> as long as you're 10 feet back from the edge of the cliff, you should get a subsidized insurance rate so that just in case, any time in the next few years, you slide down the side of the hill, the taxpayer will pay most of your loss, and you can rebuild as long as you're 10 feet back, which gives you another 10 years before the taxpayer will pay to re rebuild your home 10 feet back, which allows you to build the home the taxpayer will pay for again in 10 years. It's not getting a lot of traction in the legislature. As I said, that's a, that's a story. Uh, nobody's going to do that. As a taxpayer, I'm not going to subsidize someone so they can have a beautiful vista, and I don't, by the way. Uh, and, and I'm going to, every time their home slides down the side of the mountain, I'm going to rebuild their home. But that's what we do 
with our federal flood insurance program. It's designed to do that. It's designed to incentivize people to build on the edge of a cliff where we know the home's gonna slide down. Literally, in some cases, because of, if it's eroded by the ocean and your home slides in to the, slides down the hill, if the erosion, was, if the ocean was the proximate cause of the erosion, you get a new house if you've got a flood insurance policy. <coughs> and and uh, so I've got, to, I've got to move quickly because I talk too much and I, and I apologize <coughs> for that. Uh, but if, if you, if this is not in the report, but this is a very telling statistic. 69 cents of every lost dollar that has been paid out by the NFIP since inception has been funded by the taxpayer. Uh, I'm sorry, 59 cents, so 60%. 60% of all losses paid by the NFIP since inception have been paid for by the taxpayer, which is exactly like what I was describing earlier. Build on the side of the hill and I'll help, I'll help you rebuild your house when it goes. And, and sometimes it literally happens that way on what, what are called repetitive loss properties you actually rebuild the home over and over and over and over, letting it rebuild in the, in the exact same location, at the exact same elevation, and we, we pay for it over and over. Uh, the data that Hazard Hub is able to demonstrate, and this is in, the, in your, I believe this slide is in, in the booklet, um, but this is one, this takes our, our uh, income per capita and, and slices it into three, three categories. And you can see that, and this is a very, this, is, this slide is just really quite remarkable. Lower income people pay an average of 36 cents for their flood insurance. Middle income people pay an average of 27 cents for their flood insurance. <laughs> High income people pay an average of 24 cents for their flood insurance. And the high income people have a 151% loss ratio, and you can see that the others are below 100. That's sobering uh, in, in my estimation. And there are reasons for that, which we'll talk about in a minute, but let me, let me keep uh, just getting through these slides. Uh, all of which are upside down at this point. So I'll, uh, so I'll just turn them back right side. No, well, let's see. Now I've got this one in the way. Yeah, here we go. Now it'll work. Okay, so uh, this is by decile for household income. Interestingly, the loss ratio stays the same. But you can see now how that trends down to that 24 uh, cent rate that high income folks are paying through the NFIP. A, and, and, and again, I'll, I'll give you the two major reasons in our estimation uh, for this, this reality here in a minute. But the average premium per capita income, uh, again, using per capita, look at the, this is premium. The lower income folks pay a higher premium, premium, not rate, premium, than the middle and upper income. Upper income folks have actually, since the effects of, of bigger waters kind of skewed the data somewhat, this was in 2012, bigger waters said raise rates, NFIP raised rates, according to their current rating mechanism, as best they could predicting risk, which was very inaccurate, by the way, but. Uh, and, and then you have this big hump, and then the Homeowners Afford Flood Insurance Affordability Act was passed, and they were still told to raise rates, but not quite so quickly. Uh, and, but what's been happening is rates have been trending down. And uh, um, this might be a good place to <coughs> just very quickly interject as to why. And, uh, and Tony, I'll try, and if I don't get this right, you, you correct me. Uh, Tony Hake, by, by the way, is, is here from the NFIP, and we're grateful he's here and grateful the NFIP listens uh, to these sorts of constructive criticisms. And, and may I just say that I have tremendous respect for the people at the NFIP. They do a really 
hard job. It's a tough job that they do. Uh, but uh, this data suggests it, it, behind it is two sort of major things. One is that the current rating methodology used by the NFIP ignores the size and cost of the home. Somebody tell me how close I am to 15 minutes. How much time have I got left? You've got seven minutes. All right. So I have a 1,000 square foot home built next to a 5,000 square foot home, both in the same flood zone. All right. I'm mandated to buy $250,000 worth of coverage. My 1,000 square foot home anywhere near DC costs $250,000 to rebuild, and my 5,000 square foot home costs maybe, what, a million five or some, something like that. And, and so uh, we both buy $250,000 worth of coverage, and we both pay uh, essentially, well, let's say, the same premium. And, uh, and which of those homes for someone good at math here, 1,000 square feet, 5,000 square feet, both inundated with six inches of water, which home is going to use up more of its $250,000 limit to remediate the six inches of damage? The 5,000 square foot home, right? But, but the current rating methodology doesn't take that into account. They both get a, a, a similar rate if they're built right next to each other. So that's one reason for this trend line being like this. Another reason is, that more and more people who should be mapped into what we would call, let's say, an A flood zone or a 100-year flood zone and pay a higher rate, more and more of those people have been mapped out of the 100-year flood zone, <coughs> mostly due to local desires not to, to keep the flood zone as small as possible. So now people who should be in an A flood zone or a higher-risk flood zone are mapped out. Now they're in a low risk flood zone. They think they're low risk, but they have the same risk as the people inside the flood zone. They should be paying the same rate and buying the same insurance. The folks who have spent a lot of money on their house and realize they're as low lying as the guy across the imaginary line that somebody drew are buying flood insurance. They're buying it at a, an even more subsidized rate, a much lower rate than they should because they're not being rated as being inside of the 100-year flood zone. They're being rated outside of the 100-year flood zone. But they've got the same exposure. They're going to lose as much money for the NFIP. So, so the flood mapping issue is, is uh, have I stated that correctly, Tony, or do you wanna? <laughs> so so that's, a, that's an issue and helps you understand why this trend line moves. Because the wealthier person has a bigger home, more money at risk, and therefore is, is incentivized to buy some flood insurance, especially when they find out that it's almost free. Right? So that's one of the reasons for that. Uh, this is similar data, but it gives you a, a real view of people with low income, people of high income. Doesn't make sense. You know, and when Congress talks about affordability and says we have to keep flood insurance affordable, what they're really talking about is we have to continue to incentivize people to build where they will surely be flooded and lives will be lost. Right? That's affordability. Affordability incentivizes the continuance of the status quo, which is unsustainable especially to take into account climate change. Now, as hard as the NFIP's tried, and they've done a, a, a masterful job, really, of coming up with a way of taking everything they've learned from the private sector <coughs> and translating it over to a much better way of rating. It's called Risk Rating 2.0. And it would, it, would, it would disallow some of these dislocations that, that this data is disclosing. But the average rate in 2010 that the NFIP was charging was 26 cents. This is the NFIP's data. The average rate in 2018 is 25 cents. They were mandated by Congress twice to raise rates. And as hard as they've tried, I'm going to pause it for you, Congress won't let them do what Congress told them to do. <laughs> 
And, and, and so what we have is this terrible circumstance where we know the problem, we've demonstrated the problem. This data has been pretty well known uh, uh, on a sort of uh, an assumptive level uh, for quite some time. But we, we know we have a problem, but we just refuse to do really anything meaningful about it. And uh, if, if Congress and the NFIP, the NFIP does have some internal rules I disagree with terribly. One is uh, uh, relative to midterm cancellations, disallowing folks from being able to replace their, their policy with lower cost private policy. Um, and, uh, and, and, and the disallowing of uh, grandfather great. I'm just going to mention those even though my PR people told me not to. <laughs> stay, on, stay on point. Uh, so our, our point is that rates must be adjusted to be fairer. It, it, and, and I won't go into a lot of the details, but there's several ways to do this that will work very well, risk rating 2.0 being, being one of them. Thank you very much for listening. It's one of the few times I've ever heard applause after a flood insurance. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it to be a friendly audience. Generally, it's a different response than we get. Um, so I'm Steve Ellis. I'm the president of Taxpayers, of Taxpayers for Common Sense. Uh, I took over that job January 1. Um, but I've been there for 20 years. Uh, we're 25 years old. I've been working on flood insurance that entire time through several different iterations. Um, uh, others have been working at it, on it longer than that and longer than me. Um, so Ray had nice typed up uh, comments. You know, we had the, the the retro PowerPoint uh, there, um, but you're just going to suffer through my little handwritten notes. Um, so, two things I, I think are kind of interesting before I dive in, and Ray's asked me to talk about a couple things. One is uh, Ray mentioned the Coastal Barrier Resources Act, which President Reagan signed into law in 1982, and uh, it's I, I remember the quote. He said that uh, it meets the needs of the new environment with less government, not more. Uh, and so, I think that's a good point to push out there. Um, and then I also will say that um, uh, Craig's presentation, much of the same uh, information um, in a different way has been done by the Government Accountability Office as well. So it's not <coughs> just Craig and his team saying that. These are, the cross subsidies are very real and they're very documented. Um, and so, um, but so Ray wanted me to talk a little bit about what the state of play is um, uh, on legislation reauthorizing the program, and then about you know what is essential to get done in a reauthorization, what's feasible, and what's um, some of the bad things that are that are um, coming down the pipe. So um, I'm not going to take up my whole time because I want to hear your questions. I think it's more valuable. But uh, you know when you think about it, the fundamental role of government, like the reason why humans formed governments in the very first place, is to protect their citizens. And yet you have a federal flood insurance program that, as Craig documented, that is actually encouraging people to build and rebuild in harm's way um, and subsidizing them to do just that. Uh, you also have the case of where um, people you know, in communities are trying to, as Craig said, shrink the overall fo uh, footprint of the, uh, the A zone um, and that basically that makes it cheaper, you know, to purchase flood insurance, but it doesn't reduce the risk at all. And in many cases, people see the uh, zones as a binary decision. That basically you're either in the floodplain or you're not in the floodplain. But in reality, you're still in the floodplain. Even if you're not in the hundred-year floodplain, you're in the two hundred-year floodplain, or the three hundred-year floodplain, or five hundred or thousand-year floodplain, and you have some level of risk. And more and more people. As was pointed out, I've been, you know, NFIP has been paying more and more claims to people who are out the, outside the mandatory purchase area, which is the 100-year floodplain. <coughs> so the state of play is, is that, um, oh, and one last thing on an oversight, I, I think the commission, and I say this every time I've testified, and I have testified beside a few times, I've testified a lot of times uh, on this, but is um, the 1966 commission that, that um, made the, the, the recommendations to Congress regarding creation of a national flood insurance program. Um, and I'll just, uh, concisely, they said it's something that a flood insurance program is something to be wisely done or not done at all. Um, 
correctly structured, it could uh, promote the appropriate use of floodplains. Um, improperly structured, it could invite waste of great magnitude. Yep. Um, that part I know is a quote. Yep. Uh, and uh, I would argue that having borrowed nearly $40 billion from the taxpayer, you know, when you're taking in about a little more than $3 billion in premium revenue each year, is a waste of great magnitude. Um, dealing with that, as Ray outlined, there has uh, been this series of uh, uh, extensions. Um, there is a five-year reauthorization that has passed the House Financial Services, H.R. 3167. Um, both of our organizations, um, as part of a large coalition, um, Smarter Safer, uh, which includes not just budget groups, um, but also conservation organizations, insurance interests, housing interests, consumer interests, uh, all supported that legislation. I mean, we all would like to see more and, and better, but we think that it advances the ball, and that's where we are at this point. We're looking at evolutionary change, not revolutionary change. Um, and so it did include provisions dealing with mapping and improving mapping. Um, it did include provisions dealing with mitigation, um, which we think is important. Uh, mapping is not just about lines on, on a map. It's a risk communication tool as indicated that you know people see that they either are binary in the floodplain or not in the floodplain. The, the flood insurance um, mapping can actually communicate levels of risk to people that can help them then get to the next step, which is mitigate that risk. And so, so much of the talk has been about reducing rates. Well, the better way to reduce rates is not through arbitrary caps or even through means-tested assistance, which we support, but is through reducing rates by reducing the risk that is actually faced by the homeowner, and that is mitigation. Not just mitigation like elevation and things along those lines, but also about community-wide mitigation and things that are actually reducing risk about having open spaces and things along those lines that can actually have a wider benefit to the entire community. Um, so those are things that we think are essential that are being addressed. You know, we may, may be more aggressive, um, but feasible, you know, we think that means-tested uh, premium assistance. Right now, as has been documented, and I'm not going to belabor the point, the subsidies are going based tied on the property or tied on the history, not actually tied to what do the people, what does the homeowner actually need. And so we think that there should be means test assistance so that people who need flood insurance are able to buy it, but not choosing between groceries and flood insurance premiums. Um, and so, and it has been documented as well, Mike Craig, and is the enormous cross subsidies that are within the program that the people who are receiving a lot, many of these subsidies are the people who least need it, certainly like it, um, rather than people who are, in some cases, not buying flood insurance because they can't afford it and are still facing this level of risk. And we also know that they don't have the ability to recover from a flood event the same way that somebody with greater means does. Um, that they, you know, they don't have the savings, they don't have that um, in, in their, uh, uh, their bank account, if you would. Um, and then the bad, well, we can get into the Senate a little bit, um, uh, but uh, is the um, idea of capping rates, that we should see rates continue to increase, even if you slow down the rate of increase. Um, that we should see that uh, it continues to get closer to risk-based rates. Um, there are a lot of talks about arbitrarily capping, even like arbitrarily capping as, uh, uh, as income or home value and things that are, don't really make a lot of sense um, in our opinion. And we are for common sense at TCS. Um, <laughs> so um, those, that's one of the big issues, although it seems like there should be progress, but we're it's pretty clear that we're gonna see another extension in September. Um, you know, not a lot's gonna get done in this, uh, the rest of this Congress. Um, and so really it is about the next Congress and seeing how um, we can get a, a better uh, legislation through. Um, so th that's kind of just in a nutshell, I think how I would uh, describe the, uh, the state of play. The last thing though that I will flag is um, Craig mentioned risk rating 2.0. We've all supported that that idea. Unfortunately, the specter. Um, so not even it's not in the bill. It doesn't talk. The bill doesn't talk. The House bill doesn't talk at all about risk rating 2.0. But it is being held up over concerns over risk rating 2.0. Even though the administration has said they're not going to move forward with it as as yet. And so you're in this kind of bizarre, you know, neither fish nor fowl, where people are holding up the legislation particularly on the minority side, um, over something that doesn't exist, that isn't in the bill, and instead of 
advancing the ball, at least putting some pressure on the Senate to actually um, do something, anything in the banking committee. Um, <laughs> and uh, so that's a, that's a real issue, and we would hope that, that, that um, the powers that be would release that, and we would at least be able to move advanced legislation as we have in previous conferences. So with that, I will shut up and uh, let yeah. Thanks. Yes. Um, we doors open for questions. Uh, I would ask that you keep your questions in the form of a question and keep them relatively short. So with that, I will open. Yep. Right here. Hi. I was just wondering, because of global warming and climate change, we're going to see more flooding uh, over larger periods, uh, over larger areas of land, especially because uh, uh, the flood drift programs tend to keep people in their houses even if unsafe. How is So there are uh, programs, two, two significant programs run out of FEMA that are uh, dedicated to buyouts of particularly flood prone properties. Um, that is sometimes a controversial issue. Uh, it is, uh, to, to execute a buyout program, you need buy-in from the local community. The local community has to want uh, to, to buy out, pro when a property is bought out, it is devoted in perpetuity to open space. That, that's the way that works. Um, what that means, though, is that property is taken off the tax rolls. Um, so communities don't love losing taxable uh, properties. It is it, it, it can be problematic. Also, to date, they've all been voluntary. Uh, we've never exercised eminent domain to decide that this zone is just too flood prone and we're going to condemn all these properties and, and turn them into open space. As we move forward with a sea level rise, you would not be surprised if either of those things changes. That it, it, in some cases, eminent domain might be used uh, because there will be places that you that are no longer serviceable from a municipal perspective where you can't get. Even today, we have issues, for instance, in South Florida. I live in Florida myself. Uh, rainy, uh, <coughs> sunny day flooding. Um, you know the, the the water table rises, and you can't uh, operate a sewage system. You can't operate uh, cable and, and electricity, and without that, you can't have a community. Um, so that is that. Those are some of the things that over the long term we're going to have to start thinking about. The long term though is closer than you think. I mean, the long term could be twenty years, uh, where we where we have to start deciding which which we're going to try to save and which we're going to let the sea take. The only thing I would add to, to um, raise is that yeah. it's not just about the flood insurance program, and Drake kind of got on this, it is about community decisions and what they make. It's also about other federal programs, you know, whether it's the Army Corps of Engineers and some of their work, or if it's looking at post-disaster funding and how that is meted out, and then, you know, what, what are strengths or not strengths, how communities plan for the inevitable disaster, because each time you have, have a disaster, it's an opportunity a tragic opportunity, but an opportunity nonetheless to remake the community in a way that is less vulnerable, to take advantage. And some of that is, is that we, we've definitely learned in looking at buyouts is that the communities that have figured out what they're gonna do when the disaster occurs, that actually have a real plan in place are the ones that recover the best and that actually are able to strike while the iron is hot and say, okay, this, this subdivision, this block has been really high risk. We're going to come cash in the barrel right away because what you find is is that as people start rebuilding their homes as they're waiting for a buyout eventually the, the half-life of a disaster is relatively brief they sort of start to forget about it they put some money into it and then you're not able to do the buyout the other thing is is that you know buying out you know one home here another home there that open space doesn't give you the actual benefit that you would have mm -hmm. from a larger uh, connected open space and that's something that, that needs to be addressed and then the last thing on raise point so for instance nags head um they uh, stopped maintaining a particular road that went to certain houses because they were just like this road keeps getting flooded it could basically become a private road and they, <coughs> they, they had a whole fight within the city council but eventually came to that decision and that was one that you know we would say is, is important and it's something that more communities are going to have to take on. Okay. I'll just take a quick shot at that, and that is that I'm a big uh, fan of the invisible hand. The invisible hand will even work with uh, municipalities. Mm -hmm. 
So if you, if you envision a world where when a, a home was destroyed, um, let's say 50% destroyed, um, there was a regulation in place that, that effectively said that home's going to be uh, either removed and turned into open space. That's one good alternative, and there's lots of good reasons to do that. Thus, increasing the home values all around it, which means the tax roll goes up. So that's a good invisible hand way of letting self-regulation occur. The other thing you could do is say, we're, the community is going to have so many that go to open space, but we're also going to resell so many. We're going to auction them off to the highest bidder. And uh, they're going to have to mitigate, when they, when they rebuild, it's going to have to have certain characteristics that are going to make it so we never have to rebuild that home again and we still get to collect taxes on it. And there are ways to do that that isn't just elevation. There are ways to build the home so that it's literally, you go in with a hose, wash it out, and live in it again. Yep. So, uh, so there are ways for communities to deal with this that would actually put them in as good or better a position after the disaster as before. Great. Yes, sir. Hi, so uh, my name is Chris. I'm from Cinco Ranch, which is a large unincorporated community west of Houston that was hit particularly hard, as I'm sure you all know, by Hurricane Harvey. I think we received something like 60 inches of rain, and thousands of homes in my community were uh, completely gutted out and not destroyed. Um, and this was obviously, there's been a lot of 100, 500, 1,000 year floods in the area as of recent. But when these communities were first uh, being developed and as they continue to rapidly be developed, uh, a lot of incoming residents are not properly uh, uh, made aware of these kind of risks, yeah. even though they're literally building their house in a floodplain. Yeah. Um, so, my question is this what, what, is being done, I guess, to raise awareness of these kind of risks moving forward, or um, or perhaps de incentivize uh, these kind of risky behaviors? So, in 3167, the bill that passed House Financial Services, there is actually a flood disclosure, mm -hmm. uh, with a mandatory flood disclosure, which, which we certainly support. There are states that have been looking at that as well. Florida and North Carolina, I believe, both have bills in this session that would make mandatory flood disclosure. Uh, there's there's nothing wrong with that. It's probably not going to solve the problem of people. I mean, one of the, we're we're free market types, and so we would say the best information comes from prices, right? So you, you know what your you know what the risk is when you actually are forced to bear, uh, and that comes in the form of insurance rates. Uh, that 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 helps guide decisions about where to where to build and where not to build, where it's feasible, and, and it guides what the prices of those properties are. But it also is important that communities know, uh, it's not just in the market, that when you're making decisions about planning and zoning, um, that you're incorporating that information locally. Um, one of the things I, uh, this is not my research, it's not even my research area, but this thing that I try to emphasize over and over again, is that you can't just tell people where not to build. You have to tell them where they can build and let them build there, where it is relatively safe. This is this comes up a lot in the, in the context of California and the wildfires out there. The California also has a housing availability problem at the same time, um, and cr creating greater density in urban areas that are relatively uh, relatively safe from wildfire in areas that are at higher ground, and relatively safe from flood, is really crucial moving forward. If we have less places where it is, if where climate change makes living more challenging, we're gonna have to take, make as great use as we possibly can of the places where it is safe. Anything else? It, I, I, I would observe that we keep tr encouraging the NFIP to release lost data, <coughs> which I think they'd really like to do, but, but the, the folks inside the legal department uh, say that that the data belongs to the person who lived in the home when the loss occurs. And uh, while the private market publishes that data internally and, and, and somebody could know whether the home has had a fire or whatever, 
uh, the NFIP says we have to keep that private. Our lawyers say that they don't, and we've tr we've argued over that with them. Mm -hmm. But um, so, but but if the data simply ran with the property and were publicly available, and we recognized it wasn't the person that that got flooded, it was the house that got flooded or the structure, then then that data would be immediately available to these folks and they'd realize they were building a house in what was designed to be a lake, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's part of that big, that giant holding pond that was developed in the 30s there in Houston. It was developed, it was designed to hold water and they built homes in it, yeah. right? So that, that kind of thing, when you let the invisible hand go, it starts to disincentivize those sorts of, sort of insane outcomes. And isn't it strange now I mentioned Zillow earlier. I can I can probably find your property on the internet and look at every room in your house and know the entire history of every sale. <laughs> yeah. uh, and it's all easily available to you, but I can't know whether it's flooded. Mm -hmm. uh, that is pretty crazy. Right. And, 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 then, and then one thing on just Ray mentioned North yeah. Carolina, and I was just going to point yeah. out that North Carolina is definitely is by far our national leader as far as mapping and knowing, be, publishing people's risk and future inundation and uh, working with, like for instance, with uh, Hurricane um, Matthew. Yeah, Matthew, I get Michael and Matthew. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about Matthew. Um, you know, working with weathercasters so that people can <coughs> see like what was likely to happen and things along those lines, but risk communication like through at the state level as well, because it's not gonna all be federal government or, uh, or invisible hand. There is stuff that states can do to, again, help protect their citizenry. Yes, sir. Yeah, I can kind of just to piggyback off that and the disclosures. Um, obviously, every time you originate a mortgage, you're selling a house, the seller has to provide that disclosure statement saying whether you're simply in or out of the NFIP, uh, mm -hmm. uh, NFIP flood zone. Mandatory. Uh, mandatory, mandatory purchase, purchase yes. Yeah. Um, and even though that's regulated or mandated by the NFIP, the states themselves have a lot of say over how those disclosure forms are put together, what else mm -hmm. has to be on them. Yeah. Um, would any of you like suggest or think that we should provide more information beyond the simple in or out disclosure? Um, whether you know it's listing, hey, you may not be in the mandatory purchase area, but you're in one of these subsequent zones. Um, do you think states should start to take the lead in kind of enforcing those extra disclosures? Um, I know California's been doing a lot with like wildfire risk and earthquake risk and going what well beyond. So want to get your thoughts on that. I, uh, so it's dicey. Uh, the realtors are a big player here. They, they bear a lot of the disclosure um, burden already. And, and it makes sense for it to be at that, at that point. Um, and they, I think, endorse the, the 3167 language. I'm not entirely clear. You know, if, it, if there were anything beyond that, you're gonna have a state by state fight. Um, and it comes down to a lot of things like, who, can I get sued over this, right? That it's, we can, we can talk in the abstract about how it would be nice for consumers to get this information, but the means by which they get it triggers liability um, for the person who's responsible for providing it. And so that's where the political fight would be. I'm certainly for more, more disclosures and more information. There are some fights that is lo as long as a bare minimum is at least being met, which it currently isn't, I don't know that there, it's worth expending a lot of political capital towards putting more burden on, on one particular sector who happen to be pretty politically powerful. <laughs> so. uh, imagine a world, if you will. Let's just imagine for a moment. Imagine a world, if you will, where online, yeah. on the interweb, I think they call it, you're, you're able to put in an address yeah. and Zillow and other services provide you with all of the losses that that's ever experienced. And they provide you with, and you might pay a little extra for this, for a hazard hub or many other geotechnical uh, firms, uh, appraisal of earthquake risk, wildfire risk, flooding risk, etc. And you get that report from uh, someone who's operating under the invisible hand, right? So now the realtors, all they have to do is either offer that as a service, I'm gonna give you that as a free thing because you list your home with me, I'm gonna create that for you. 
or maybe you do it as a home, wise home buyer, you're buying from somebody who's got it listed for sale by owner, you go to the web and you find that out. Why can't we do that? You know, it doesn't need regulation, it doesn't need a lot of ifs, ands, and buts. All it needs is to say, that data must be published. It must be publicly available because it goes with the property, right? Ditto. Is it not the case that automobiles, uh, sure, kind of data, exactly. it's, it's almost right. always available for right. automobiles? Yes, it's been, it's been, it's in, been, a flood. It's been in a it's flood. It's been in a flood. You, you, know, flood. you definitely know. Yeah. Well, yeah. my only yeah. comment, and then I, I uh, is it, it does seem to me, and I've looked in this area a little bit, mm -hmm. that that disclosure, that one of the one of the market failures that we have here is about disclosure. Yeah. I mean, we just, pe uh, uh, we don't necessarily, as consumers, who don't spend all day trying to become an expert in yeah. hazards, yeah. Uh, uh, it's it's a bit surprising to us sometimes when, when we discover that there is info or that that I should have had some information that would have um, warned me yeah. about what I was getting into. Yeah. And we did see there is in the House legislation uh, 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 one version <coughs> of how that information could be could be transferred yeah. and. Um, and a lot of the good reports that people have done has been because they looked at bigger yep. sets of data and then could begin to uh, elucidate mm -hmm. on what's involved. Yep. So I definitely it's such uh, higher ground uh, in yeah. 1998. Sure, right. right. <laughs> yes, <laughs> speaking yeah. of the author. A, a report that I was involved in. Like and a lot of people don't 20 know, or 30 years you, ago. You can go on FEMA's website and find out your zone, right? Which is, which is something that yes. many people don't even do, and I encourage everyone to do. Uh, in Florida, it is something everyone has to do on a regular basis. But yeah. Well, on this mapping, uh, the better the maps, the yeah. better. Yeah, because absolutely. It, it, it helps people it's make a risk communication choice. Yeah, yeah, it's a risk communication tool. Mm -hmm. yeah. Additional questions? We probably have time for one more, and then that'll, that'll be it. Um, what did we learn about the experience in New Orleans in the, in the 8th and 9th War and, and subsequently to that? Yeah, but we've learned a lot of things, among them that you know our, our levy system is, is a problem. I mean, it, with respect to how, how it impacts the NFIP, something that um, I don't deal with in, in this particular paper, but has, has long been uh, known to be an issue is one reason that communities have incentive to build flood control structures like that is, is to not be in the zone, right? That, that's why they're incentivized to build those structures. But not being in the zone means those people are not protected and they are not at zero risk, because levies fail, as we've seen. Um, and so uh, looking at that residual risk, requ you know, requiring those people to still have coverage way cheaper than they would be if there were no levy, um, but still have the bare minimum of coverage is certainly important because there is a major protection gap there uh, if you don't go buy the flood insurance and, and the levies fail. I mean, this is not just New Orleans, this goes back to Johnstown, you know, and it, we've been dealing with this for more than a century. Well, and, and um, residual uh, uh, risk coverage, I mean, that was a provision that wasn't bigger yeah. waters until basically very, the yeah. very last minute. Um, and requiring purchase, but then, I mean, there were sadly a lot of lessons from New Orleans, some of which gets into levy construction and the failures of the Army Corps of Engineers and how they designed the levees, not so much in the, in the Lower Ninth Ward, but in the Lebanon the Canal and the 17th Street Canal. But then there, you also had issues um, learning about the Mississippi River Gulf Outlet and Mr. Go and, and the issues, but it does get back to is that people, you, even if you have protection, you have some level of risk. And so, but, and to kind of underscore Ray's point that once you, once you provide a 100 year level of protection, you're basically deemed to not be in the 100 year floodplain, even though absent that protection, you would be inundated. And so many people, they want that, and they're fighting for it, whether you're talking about East St. Louis or some other communities where they, they basically want to have this flood protection, but, that's not, doesn't eliminate risk. And especially as you see more of these rain events as well. And so I'm really 
moved by uh, Craig Fugate, former director of FEMA, is talking about how um, after the rainfall event in Baton Rouge, so up the river, um, that the average person who had flood insurance got a payment of $86,500. The average person who didn't have flood insurance got a disaster assistance payment of $9,100. And you can't rebuild your life on $9,100. The, the observation I would make about uh, New Orleans and that area of Louisiana is that it is America's Holland, Netherlands, as they call it in Europe. Um, it needs mitigation, not insurance. It needs a lot of mitigation, more than other areas of the country. That's the solution for, for the low-lying areas in Louisiana. Uh, for the rest of the country, what we've talked about, trying to disincentivize building in low-lying areas, I think will work quite well. But Louisiana is a special case, and we need, what if we had taken 10 billion of the 40 that we've already paid over the last 40 years? Yeah. What if we've taken $10 billion and built weirs and levees and dams, a system yeah. intelligently designed to manage water flow, even 500 year, 1,000 year events, so that massive areas of New Orleans weren't destroyed. Yeah. Massive areas of New Orleans would be effectively safe. Yeah. Do you know how long it's been since the Netherlands had a catastrophic event? Yeah. 1950, because after 1950, they started spending serious money on weirs and levees and dams. Great. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, we'll be hanging around afterward if you have any further questions. Thanks again.